right, welcome everyone. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, this is kind of a cool moment. Things kind of gone full circle. I remember when Ray interviewed me 11 years ago. So uh, it's good to see that we're both kind of doing the same thing. And still alive. Yeah. And still alive. Yeah. So the book that, that Ray just authored, Life Between the Vines, uh, is a continuation of really, it's the longest running wine podcast in North America. And I encourage you to take a book and peruse it while we're talking. You can uh, see what the content of this book is about and probably spark a lot of interesting questions that you could ask because what you find in Ray here is sort of like, I don't know, you've, you've interviewed hundreds, if not thousands of winemakers. So if there's ever a question that's been burning in your head about a particular winemaker, a particular region, a particular style of wine, some quirky thing about some winemaker you heard, Ray's probably the guy that, that knows the, the in-depth story behind each one of those people. Uh, but yeah, I encourage you to take a look at that book. Um, as you know, I'm in that book, but you know, there's a lot more interesting people besides myself in that book. Um, but I like this, this notion of uh, this book in the sense that we have the same philosophy, which is wine is not about pretension, it's more about passion. And uh, you know, it's, um, it's just, we don't want wine to be intimidating, it should be fun. So I don't have any technical training in wine, but I'm learning as I go. I think that's the same case for, for Ray too. Like the more you know about the wine, the more you realize how much you don't know. So that's kind of the beauty of wine. It can be as simple or as complex as uh, you want it to be. And so I'm of the philosophy here today, and I think Ray is too, that you know, hit us with a lot of questions because he loves to tell stories and to me that's what wine's about is getting, getting together to talk about stories uh, that bring people together. So before we get any further, I'd just like everyone to raise their glass and propose a toast here that uh, we approach wine like we do life around here, which is it's about discovering, enjoying, and sharing. So thanks to you all. Cheers. Cheers. So with that, I'll let Ray take it from here. Tasty. Mm. Good stuff. Steve makes good wine. Thank you everybody for coming today. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Ray and uh, I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, I'll tell you about the book in just a minute, but I encourage you to ask questions uh, at any point in the conversation, but I am going to ask you if you don't mind to go up to that microphone up there and pose your question. That way we can get that both on video as well as be able to hear it through the PA so everybody can hear the question. Does that work for everybody? Sure. Good, because you can't leave the room until that happens. I've locked all the doors from the outside, so that's how it works. Uh, so I'm a wine lover, like I'm assuming many of you are. I've been drinking wine for as long as I care to think about. I started the wine podcast uh, 14 years ago this August, so that makes it the longest running wine podcast online. Um, the way I started this was my uh, profession is I'm an audio engineer, professional audio engineer. I've done radio, TV, commercials, film for uh, 40 some years. And uh, <laughs> my passion is audio, if you may notice. And I saw this opportunity of blending my two passions together, wine along with the idea of information and, and audio and being able to pull the curtain away, if you will, and let winemakers tell their stories. So that started it. I, uh, I read a book a long time ago, I guess it would have been close to 20 some years ago, called uh, Napa, the Story of an American Eden. And it fascinated me. First time I visited Napa Valley, I was just knocked out by the beauty. I was like every other goofball who goes there. Gee, I want to live there. <laughs> and nobody could afford that. But uh, I wanted to learn more, and I've read extensive history, both the good and the bad, about what went on there over the last couple of hundred years. But this particular book educated me about some people that I regard as heroes of the industry, how they brought it back, uh, how they made America, uh, America a force in wine after Prohibition pretty well crushed, crushed poor use of words there, crush. Yeah. Uh, crushed the industry totally uh, when that came about. I mean, that was... Uh, a long time without being able to legally drink wine. Uh, somehow people managed to do that. I'm not quite sure how that happened. So Napa Valley took a long time to establish itself as this major region by focusing on quality and by some people 
whose history goes back to actually the 1800s, where there were many wineries in Napa Valley and, and many other areas that people don't realize that 80, 90 percent of them pretty much went out of business after Prohibition started, and then slow but sure they started coming back. This book introduced me to these people. I found them interesting characters. I found them fascinating. And when I started this project, I never dreamed in a million years I'd be able to meet some of them. And I did. Uh, I met quite a few of them. The only person I didn't get to meet was a guy named Robert Mondavi. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. Sadly, he passed away a year before I started the project. But uh, I know I would have gotten to interview him. I've interviewed his brother, Peter, before he passed away. And I re-interviewed his son, Tim, as well as his granddaughter, Carissa. And just to meet these people, I'm a musician. I, uh, just like anybody else, hero worship when it comes to my favorite musicians. Well, meeting these people was, at first, very scary. And the more I got to talk to them, I realized they're just like me. They're passionate. They have a great love for what they're doing, and they're having fun. Uh, winemakers, you know, more so out west where it's a little warmer, get to spend so much time outside. I know you spend a lot of time outside as is. But um, to take this, this kind of career, you know, some of these people didn't even know you could make a living as a winemaker, which fascinates me. So that got me into this journey of interviewing Originally, most, mostly winemakers in Napa Valley. I drifted into Sonoma and then drifted into all kinds of places. I've interviewed French winemakers. I've been to Italy a couple of times. Uh, I've interviewed winemakers in Idaho, Louisiana, Ohio, my home state, uh, uh, Indiana, uh, Finger Lakes, quite a few winemakers in Finger Lakes, Texas, uh, Arizona, uh, Georgia, Virginia, Florida. Yes, they make wine in Florida, believe it or not. And uh, France. Uh, Spain, uh, Australia, New Zealand, all over the place. I find them fun, fascinating people. Somebody once said to me, why are all these people who make wine so happy? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, it's been a great journey. So I wrote the book a couple of years ago, and eventually we self-published it. And it's been my great pleasure to put it out there for people for a couple of reasons. One is to enjoy the humor in wine. If you look at some of these pictures, winemakers posed in unique ways with their wine bottles. And number two is to educate people on some of these terms. Some of them are common terms, maceration, uh, with the words that are blanking right now in my mind. But batonage. Thank you, batonage. Batonage is the one winemaker refers to it. He, uh, uh, the whole point was to educate people, but also to appreciate the humor, because some of the words are in-house words. And some of those in-house words are a little more colorful. Some of those colorful words didn't necessarily make the book. But uh, anyway, that was my goal. And now the book is in your hands. I hope you consider buying it. And part two is already in the process of being put together. And I still do podcasts. I, the podcast goes out, uh, by the way, lifebetweenthevines.com, for those of you who are interested in checking it out. Um, the podcast goes out every Monday, and then every Thursday we do a section, oddly enough, called Vino Lingo Video, which are the Vino Lingo terms done to video. There is a full-length video that is available for this particular book. I've not uh, made access to it just yet, but you can send me an email. And for a minor fee, you'll be able to get a hold of that video. Right now, I'll be in Sonoma next week for the Sonoma Barrel Auction, which is a trade-only auction, which means it's within the industry. Uh, buyers within the industry will be able to come and buy these very special wines. They'll bid on these wines. And the funding, or the money goes to fund the Sonoma Vintners Association. And so uh, what I do during these events is I'll walk around. These people will be pouring. They'll have a barrel just like this, vertically set up. Their wines will be there. And I'll go from person to person and do fairly brief interviews talking about what they're pouring and just get kind of little nuggets of information from them. And then uh, later on, I'll be in California in the Livermore area, which is a lesser known wine area, but making some great wines. And uh, a few other places that aren't coming to mind immediately. So I'm going to talk to Steve about a few things here and do a bit of interview. But before we go any further, is there anybody who'd like to ask any questions at all before I continue yakking? OK. In a minute? That's fine. You can take your time. So 
When I first met Steve, I met him through a colleague in my business, a graphic designer who uh, happened to be Steve's cousin, and uh, a very nice guy called Aaron Johnson, oddly enough. And uh, to find out his cousin was a winemaker was kind of fortuitous, and that's how these things happen. I meet people that way all the time, which always fascinates me. Uh, I didn't really know much about Wisconsin wines at the time, although uh, there are a couple, Wollersheim being a quite well-known name in the state, I know about. But um, for me and what I've learned about wine and how people make wine, the idea of making wine in cold weather climate it's just an incredible challenge. I mean, how do you do that and still kind of live a normal life? Or do you live a normal life? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you just mentioned Wollersheim. I was just there two days ago. That's the largest vineyard in Wisconsin. I talked to Philippe. We, we share, you know, the pains and joys of, of winemaking. He's been at it longer than I have. But he told me on Sunday night, all 35 acres of his vineyard uh, was frozen. And so he'll have maybe a couple secondary buds that he'll get maybe 20% of his fruit from. But it's the equivalent of taking a million dollar check of profit and just ripping it in half in a matter of minutes. So when you, when you get into this endeavor, uh, you, it's not for the faint of heart. But you know, we have different challenges. You know, some would say, well, it's more difficult than California. Maybe to some degree, but they have to deal with wildfires now. They have to deal with drought. They have to deal with the changing climate that affects the varieties and how they express themselves. So that's what I love about wine is that it's a true um, test of your will, your ability to understand nature, your ability to communicate with people, and it's always changing on you. So it's never boring. Um, you kind of have to be in it for the journey, not the goal, because there is no goal in winemaking, I think. Every time you make a great wine, you go, oh, I have to make a better wine. It just never ends. So it's, that's why they say it's a passionate business. Like, uh, you know, it is a business like all their business in the sense that you have to make money at it. You have to put your time and effort into it. You have to market your product. But it does require sometimes to, to do stuff that's not always economically beneficial for you because your goal is to create something that has a lot of things going on and you have to sort of guide it on a path that people can enjoy and you, you, you're you kind of a control freak as a winemaker but you have to understand you can't control everything so that's that's the most difficult thing I think for a winemaker whether you're in Napa or Wisconsin. But you certainly try to control everything don't you? Yeah it's it's, it's <laughs> occupational hazard. What's unique about wine unlike just about any other business I could think of, is that you're a manufacturer, you're a wholesaler, you're a retailer, you're a compliance person. You certainly get involved with politics, whether you like it or not, somewhere along the line. You're an employer, uh, you're a husband, your wife. You, you've got all these different plates you're spinning. And you have to find a way to live something close to a normal life. Now, you've raised a family. Uh, I got to believe to some degree it's a little bit easier now since the kids are flown the coop, but has that changed or? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, there, I always made a conscious decision before we started this venture was that I didn't want to sacrifice time with the kids or as a family for the sake of the business. I could have spent a lot more time on it, but I didn't want to have any regrets. And it wasn't only because like hopefully someday they'll want to be part of the business because they saw it as an enjoyable thing and dad was happy a lot of the time. It was really just a matter of like I didn't want to have any regrets of missing out on anything. But um, you know, the, the thing that probably strikes me the most about this business or what we've been doing, you know, when people ask like, you know, what is the thing that you're most proud of? Most winemakers would say, oh, it's this particular vintage or this region has become popular. I think it really is as basic as I'm proud of the fact that our family was able to do this together. Um, I'm not just saying it because Maria's here, but that's, you know, as you look over time, you realize it was a, a multi-layered, multi-person effort. So that's, I think, a, a big rewarding thing in this business. I think uh, you bring up an interesting point, too, uh, while well, I'm asking about family. Uh, I talk about Napa Valley. Let me clear this up for one minute. I talk about Napa Valley quite a bit because I get a lot of support from Napa Valley, which helps. I also get a lot of support from Sonoma and from other areas. But I've gotten to know many people in the industry there, and some I would call my friends, which I never expected as time went on. But the one thing I really love is the Napa Valley Vintners Association is made up of 
over 500 wineries. And over 80% of those wineries are still family winemakers. Now, in this days of corporate takeovers, you know, that's unfortunate, but it's going to happen. But still, they're managing to stay the course out there, which impresses me because, right, they've got different challenges out there. Uh, the other challenge they're running into, and I know your kids are younger, many of these wineries don't have succession plans, or they do. You know, a lot of these kids, <laughs> believe it or not, they may grow up in a place like Napa and say, I, I don't want to live out in farmland, I want to live in the city. And they'll want to get out. Some of them come back, some of them don't. So when you reach that point, you have to figure out, well, my kids aren't going to take it. Uh, I'm going to have to sell. And a couple of wineries I know that were big shocks to me when they sold. But it's part of the necessity, and it depends on who you sell to. So it just shows to show the pressure you're under as a winemaker. While it's fun and most winemakers are very happy, uh, it's... It's a great deal of work that goes into it. Purple hands. Yeah. That stuff. In October, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, what's the most interesting wine region you visited, other than Wisconsin, of course? Hmm. Ah. And I'm talking the globe here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not as well-traveled as you, Ray. I've been to Napa, I've been to Sonoma, I've been to the Willamette Valley, um, been to Champaign. Um, been to Tuscany, but there's so many other places I want to go. But I think the thing that struck me the most was, uh, I think, being in Champagne and just being on this bus ride from Paris to the Champagne region and looking to my left and right, and I, I took out my phone just in awe because envision here when you drive down a road in Wisconsin, you see nothing but cornfield. There you look left and right, vineyards, vineyards, everywhere you can look. It's like, oh, that is my dream someday to see all of the peninsula or all the lakeshore of Wisconsin <laughs> filled with vineyards. And uh, people think it's crazy, but the reality is we have our own appellation now, just like Champagne has its appellation. And uh, the, the climate, topography, soils are very similar. It's just, uh, it's just the mindset of trying to maybe get a few farmers to realize that in the end it might be more financially beneficial to start growing grapes and making wine. We have all the key components, components to make, you know, Wisconsin, like America's version of Champaign region. So to see that firsthand rather than just hearing about it, reading about it, like it's kind of brought to life, like, yeah, that, that could happen here. Maybe not in my lifetime, but to see it, ha you know, like something like that and then sort of project it into Wisconsin was kind of a cool thing. Well, one of the funniest conversations I run into is with people saying, oh, Wisconsin wine. I mean, how can you compare it to Napa Valley or Sedona or any of these places? Well, it's a darn good wine. It's a darn good sparkling wine. Uh, prejudice is a bad thing, any kind of prejudice. So to sit back and say that one particular wine is not going to be good without at least trying it. Okay, if you don't like it and you've tried it, great. I'll endorse that. That's fine. But once you try these wines... I've tried wines from all over. Again, I'm original. I'm an Ohio boy. I was born in Cleveland, and there's some wonderful wines being made here, there. I've tried a number of wines here in Wisconsin that are very good. I've got a home winemaker that lives about a mile away from us, a really great guy. And I've tried two of his wines. And, I mean, the second time, he, 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 second wine he'd give me, the white I really loved. I had his second, his red, and he goes, it's okay, you could be, you could be tough on me. And it's really good wine. He's passionate. He is as knowledgeable as Steve. Uh, it fascinated me to talk to a guy who was making wine himself and putting this amount of work in that kind of dedication and dealing with birds and netting and weather and wind. Wind, wind killed his crop last year. Last year. It, it's fascinating. So the one thing I always say to people, it doesn't matter. Give it a try because there's a lot of wines I've had that I... I would put my, maybe turn my nose up to 20 years ago, and I don't anymore because they're good. So that was my pitch on Wisconsin wine. Uh, any questions at all yet? Anybody like to ask a question? I see a hand way back. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, Steve, you and I were talking a little bit earlier, and we started talking about the kind of the drop off in wine sales, and it, it affects both of us because I buy wine and you make wine. What do you do? How do we introduce a younger population, which is where you need to go, to bring them along? What, do, what are we going to do? You as a winemaker only maybe get 40 shots at making wine. 
in your lifetime. Yeah. What do you do with what you've got left? Yeah, I, I think in the end, it's incumbent upon people like me and Ray and you to start realizing what does the customer want? You know, there's a lot of tradition in wine, which I kind of love, but the reality of it is, is that in any business, you have to give the customer what they want. So we can talk a lot of technicalities about the wine, we geek out on it, that's critical, but in the end, wine, like any other beverage or any other food, it's about how do people want to enjoy their life and connect with each other. And I think the wine business has to maybe kind of pick it up a notch and realize we got to come where they are versus like, hey, I've made this Cabernet for, for eight generations. It's won a lot of awards. Drink it. Like the younger people might go, that's what my mom and dad did, but that's not what I do. So you have to find ways to connect with people. And sometimes I think it's with the story. So I think this is a book. It's a good example of trying to do something like that, like make it less pretentious. Uh, I always tell the analogy on the tour that, you know, my son loves baseball. And he doesn't love baseball because I sat down with him one day and said, Isaac, you're six years old. Here's the rules of the game of baseball. You have to actually go to a game, see the sights, hear the sounds, smell the smells, and like fall in love with it. And then you want to know more about that. And I think with wine, we sometimes have been too like, okay, you got to know all these things, and then maybe you might kind of like wine. Like, just drink it, enjoy it, let your mind go where it wants to, talk to people about it, talk in the way that you want to talk about it, and then you might get the, 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 the fever and start getting more and more into it. But I think that's how we have to approach it. Like, come to the customer where they're at, find out what they're interested in, and offer that to them versus like saying, we know everything, you gotta appreciate these elements, otherwise you're not cool. And it's a change in marketing as well. I think the marketing to in wine in general is, is pretty dusty. And I think that dust needs to be blown away and people just start paying attention to it. And you know, the best part, I'm looking in the other room, I see plenty of young people drinking wine, wine there right now. Uh, the best thing about wine is what we're doing right now, sitting with people, talking, remembering this maybe, hopefully, uh, having that memory of that, that get together and how you can take that to other people and show how much fun that is. And you can do that with other adult be beverages. I mean, craft beer is a big deal, but it's, it's not quite the same thing, in my opinion. It's similar, but I think it'll come back. That's just my thinking. Maybe I'm just being an optimist. Yeah, I yeah. think it's, it has to be about enjoyment. I mean, you only do something repeatedly if you enjoy it. And if you're thinking too much about it or worried about it or like, I, I don't feel like I'm in my comfort zone when I'm drinking wine because I don't know how to answer questions, um, then that, the fun's gone. It's so it, it's got to be about, you know, enjoying life because if you're not enjoying what you're doing, you're not going to repeat it. There was a question in the back. I saw a hand. If you don't mind, come on up to the microphone. Thanks. So my question is a little bit of a two-part question, so bear with me a minute. Sure. Um, so you talked a little bit about champagne, and so this is for both of you. What do you think about, will Wisconsin be able to grow Chardonnay or Oxaris? We already have Marquette, which some say could be a cousin to Pinot Noir, to a certain extent from a flavor standpoint. Could we market Wisconsin as being the North American Burgundy? You want to go first? No, you go for that. I personally believe that it can because I know that these varietals have the components that you want for great champagne, which is high acidity, lower sugars, because we have a cool climate along Lake Michigan. So uh, my understanding is that champagne, they tried to do what the rest of France did and realized, damn, it's just so cold up here every other year. It's not as good as we hoped for it. So we decided to stick to a style that we can consistently do, which is sparkling wine, which has those elements of high acidity, low sugar. I know the climate's changing, but here in, along the lakeshore of, of Lake Michigan, we're going to always have these conditions better than in California or other parts of the country. So I think it can be true sparkling wine, capital of North America. Uh, I hear other wineries in the state talk about doing sparkling wine. Um, you know, it, it could become the signature style of, of uh, the Midwest as a sparkling expression. Because if you look at almost every wine region, and you can confirm this, Ray, it's not true of everyone, but you look at a certain region, there's a certain varietal or style that they're known for. If you visited Wisconsin wineries, you would never get that because we're like, we're all over the place. We got sweet, dry, fruit, grape, serious fun. Like, what is Wisconsin wine? I don't think we have a definition yet. Yeah. But if I'm around 
30 years from now, I'm going to think it's either going to be white or sparkling wine. I think a lot of markets have a problem with that identifying one particular thing that sticks to them. You know, Napa Cab is king, Pinot Noir for Sonoma, Pinot Noir for Oregon, that kind of thing. But to kind of jump off what you're saying, uh, it's fascinating. Sparkling wine has changed quite a bit over the last few years, and I'm sure you can back me up on this, is in the past, men were big drinkers of sparkling wine, for whatever reason, I don't know. Or it was considered a celebratory drink. And it's an everyday drink. Every time I do a tasting, I will always crack a bottle of it, whether it be a Pet Nat or a sparkling wine or a champagne, first to clear the palate, and again, just to kind of enjoy the start of things. But you're seeing more men drinking it, I'm assuming, in general. Yeah, it's never bothered me, but yeah, I think uh, <laughs> you, you do see more men doing Cheers. that. Yeah. Oh, wait, you need more, you need more wine. In I do. But, um, and it goes back to the whole point of like, life's about enjoying. Uh, enjoying the moment and so sparkling wine is that perfect beverage to do that um, like you said it cleans the palate there's something about it the the pop of the cork the fizz in the glass it's happy times and just one more thing about that in my journeys i had a woman contact me some years ago probably about five six years ago from idaho from boise idaho and she said hey i follow your podcast uh would you be interested in talking to some winemakers here and i'm like yeah sure absolutely and we got chatting she's a young woman Married, two kids, her and her husband met while, you know, rafting down these crazy, the Snake River Valley, that kind of thing. And I said, so what are you making? And she said, sparkling wine. And I said, what else are you making? She said, sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. I, and saying the stupidest thing I could possibly say, and you're selling it? They're making a great living out of making pet net and sparkling wine. And... That's fantastic, and this is in Idaho of all places, and I've tried it, and it's excellent. So the same thing goes for a place like, this is an excellent sparkling wine. I'm not saying it just because Steve is here, or the $10 he slipped me before we started talking today. No, but seriously, it, it always comes back to this concept of prejudice when you try something. There are wines in the past I haven't wanted to taste, and then I taste them, and I feel, oh, that's that great prejudgment coming at me, you know, so... Anyway, you had a second question? Yeah, and you might have answered it, but I, I think one of the things I run into with Wisconsin wine um, that makes it different, you know, again, going back to maybe French wine, is France has a tendency to um, be very confident and not apologize. This is what we make, and you better be okay with it. And if you're not, you can go somewhere else. Do you think in Wisconsin we have a tendency to not have enough confidence, and so we disguise the wine somewhat? Yeah, I was just talking about this topic. I foolishly volunteered to be the president of the Wisconsin Winery Association. <laughs> so we had a strategic meeting, and uh, so we had 12 of us there. And um, you have to be careful because we got the full spectrum of different wines being made, and you don't want to step on anyone's toes. Um, but I said, you know, and then we had the director of tourism for the state there too. And he started talking to us about, you know, what your message should be, what's your mission, what's your mission and what's your vision. And we're all kind of like, and he's like, you guys don't realize if you go down to Chicago and talk about Wisconsin wine, they think it's cool. Um, you never really appreciate it in your own backyard. So I think um, my general view is that we suffer from too much Midwestern modesty. Like we certainly don't have the reputation of Napa, Champagne, Bordeaux, because we don't have the experience. But the, co the core components, the passion, is here like it is there and if we continue to hone our skills I think we will have eventually the reputation that those wine regions have um, and that's another key aspect about the wine business is that everything is super competitive these days you have to have a message Wisconsin doesn't have a message yet but if you don't talk about yourself people won't know about you um, we have to do a better job even within our own wine stores in Wisconsin Usually the Wisconsin wine section is tucked in the corner of the store. It's kind of like only for those people who know about it will they find it. Um, and some would argue that we should have some of our wines placed in the sections, blended sections uh, of other wine stores so that people might take notice of it. So we have a huge reputational thing to, um, to work on, not only in terms of quality, but just awareness. Because if I walked down Wisconsin Avenue in Milwaukee today, or walk around the Capitol Square in Madison and said, would any of you care for a La Crescent or Marquette? Even after we've been doing this 15 years, nine out of ten people would look at me like, "What did you just say to me?" Yeah, right, like right. those, and I people kind of laugh, but I, I really believe that 98% of Wisconsinites 
have not had wine from the Crescent or Marquette or the varietals that we're doing. So certainly we need to get better at what we're doing, but we need to do a better job of marketing our message. Yeah, it frustrates me in, in retail that you will go and, and see all these wines and then you, you've already said this tucked away in a corner. They should be on the same shelves. If there's Cabernet, there's Cabernet. If there's uh, Cabernet Franc, whatever it might be, there's no excuse for that. And it is start of the uh, part of education. That's the retail end of things, which I don't get too much involved in. You had a question. I was just going to say that we were just at the Biltmore Estate, and we went to a tasting, and it was wine pairing with chocolate. And it was an awesome experience. And I see you guys are doing the one with cheese here. Yes. And in your marketing, have you thought of, or I'm sure you have thought of, um, collaborating. We, we are known for our cheese. I mean, we even have cheese heads, you know, Packer fans. So have you um, looked at efforts to kind of um, tag along with, you know, our brand in cheese and do more in that area to market the wines, to get more notice, even with local grocery stores and, you know, wine, you know, places that sell adult beverages. Yeah, um, it makes sense because there's connotations of quality go with other aspects of quality. And so Wisconsin's probably, you know, the one of the best reputations in the world in terms of artisanal cheese. Uh, some would say, well, you need to have the love of your wine match the quality of the cheese. And not every wine in Wisconsin, I think, has the ability to pair well with artisanal cheese that's crafted very well. But that does have that potential. But it's funny that you said the Biltmore, because we actually just got a call from the Biltmore last fall. And the winemaker there, I don't know, for some reason, ordered Petite Pearl and the Crescent online. And they loved it so much, they said, can you tell us how to do this? Because we're going to put in two acres of the Crescent and Petit Pearl at the Biltmore Estate. Like, why would you do that? You already have Cabernet or Chardonnay. But then it goes back to this whole Midwest modesty of like, well, you know, the bottom line is, and as I've traveled a few wine regions, like you, you still have to grow the grapes the same way and make the product and do all the technical things that the world's most famous wine regions do. And so if the Wisconsin winemakers realize, you know, you're working just as hard as the winemaker in Bordeaux, maybe we'd have an aura about ourselves that would rub off on the public to make them more interested in the wine. But yeah, I think it makes sense if we could work with the Wisconsin cheesemakers to promote what the quality is. And, uh, and I think young people are into, I just, I have two adult children, and they're into experiences. So something where you, pay, you show them what to pair it with, and it was very interesting because they were showing us, you know, when it's paired right, and then when it's paired wrong. Yeah. It's a huge difference. And our son has lived in Dallas for many years, and he has really gotten into that. And I think those experiences, like you're offering today, you know, or this month, uh, with the pairing with cheese is, is a great idea yeah. to introduce young people and draw them in. So. And the other thing I always tell other winemakers is that um, you know, we need to do a better job as winemakers, but our success is going to hinge more on you guys out there as the ambassadors for Wisconsin wine than us as winemakers talking in the inner circle about what we need to do better. You know, in the end, it's about word of mouth as to why people gravitate towards things. And now with the use of social media, if someone like really catches on to what's cool, it, it could really take off. So it's really not, we have to do a, a really good job at all times, but it's really contingent on you guys as to whether or not Wisconsin wine takes off. Yeah, image is a big deal. And, and on the other hand, <laughs> Burgundy is really expensive, as are most French wines, although there are inexpensive ones too. But you know, it's always that thing about experimenting and trying different wines. Any more questions? Anything we can talk about? Anything? Yes? So, Ray, um, my wife just talked about our, our Biltmore experience. And I walked away from Biltmore one story, a quick story from Biltmore was when George Vanderbilt first started the wines, um, he commented to his friends, here's a bottle of my first wine, crack the bottle after I die, because it was that bad. <laughs> um, and it, it drove the point that wines are, are really best when they match up with the climate and the soils and everything like that. Um, 
then I went into the wine shop and I saw North Carolina wines. I saw all kinds of Sonoma wines and um, California and, and Willamette Valley wines. But then I saw American wines, which they explained to me were a blend of wines from all over. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you go to when you go to Napa or Sonoma or places like that, and you talk about all these wineries, are they selling under their own label, or are they ultimately selling, you know, a bulk product, commodity product that gets blended? How does how does that work? I, I don't. That's I think about wineries like Parallel Forty Four, sure. where we come and we experience wine that's grown. Here, or at least in in this region, right? Yes, uh, that's a very very good question. In Napa Valley and many growing areas, there are rules about how much wine you can put into a bottle in terms of percentage. I believe in Napa it was 75 percent that has to be from Napa itself, yeah. and usually any of those other wines might be coming from uh, other grapes might be coming from maybe Central Valley. It could be, you know, slightly different areas, but it it could be for blending. But these days. Single vineyard, uh, you know, wines coming from one particular vineyard in that area, whether it be Washington, whether it be Oregon, are a big deal. And that gives owners, or sorry, buyers a little more confidence to know that their grapes are coming from one place. In, I forgot what year the law was changed. I think it was in the 60s where they could put a, pretty much whatever they wanted. And there were big makers there, Central Valley, Coastal, whatever, into a bottle and just marketing it under that name. So that changed. So generally, most areas, and I say generally, the laws are covering these kind of things. So, and if you have a different experience, let me know, that you know with confidence those grapes are coming from that area. If you buy a bottle, uh, I just had a wine called Cannonball. It's California wine. So it could come from literally anywhere. Uh, and it's truth at labeling as much as possible. But if it says Napa Valley, it's going to be at least 75% from there. And winemakers understand one thing that they ever under understand anything. If their wine's not acceptable, people don't like it, they're gonna question it just like you are. So uh, most areas are pretty good about that. But the, the laws change in every state. Yeah, I, I think it can be confusing to some people, but um I like the European method of really selling the wine more on region than varietal. In the U.S., we're all about, I'll have a Chardonnay, I'll have a Cabernet, I'll have a Riesling, and we don't talk about our regions, and we kind of do it with our Appalachian system, and that, you know, if you're going to use the Appalachian name, you have to be, I think, um, well, Wisconsin has to be 75% Wisconsin to be Wisconsin to be the Wisconsin Ledge. It needs to be 85% grown in the particular region here. But um, the more you get into wine, the more you realize like when you go and taste wine, you're tasting a place in time. Right. So that's a little bit romantic, but like I'm not always interested in having a Cabernet. I want a Cabernet from a certain year, from a certain place, because it's different than a Cabernet from another place and another time. So not everyone thinks that way about wine, but the more you get into it, you, you do realize that those nuances of, of place matter and time matter. So the vintage dating on a bottle of wine is really critical. So you don't really, I don't think you, you get a vintage date if it just says American. No, I've only had a little bit of experience with that. I've dealt with a wine company out of New York who they bought American wine. And uh, it was kind of a, a mutt wine. It wasn't bad. There's nothing wrong with it. But, yeah, I, I think the rules, it's a different concept. But I don't think it's an overly popular one right now. I don't think it's something you're going to see commonly. I, again, people are really focused on varietals and some people on areas. And people who taste certain wines and like certain wines are going to go back. For those areas, if you're, you know, if you're a R Russian River person, you're going to buy those wines. I love Pinot Noir from Russian River. Uh, it, you know, it just kind of depends. So I hope I answered that question. So Steve, just as a, a plug f for you, I mean, we've tried wines from all over the place, and we're wine club members here for a reason because mm. we like the wines that you make. Yeah. And um, so. A follow-up question, my business travels through the years, took me on many, many back roads in, throughout, the, throughout the United States, New York, Virginia, North Carolina, etc. And I would see lots of 
local wineries. And I never really thought about it, okay? But now in retirement, um, there's an opportunity there to do a, our own wine tasting tour. And um, Ray, have you ever come across guides or are, would there be a help that we could create our own vineyard tour if we're in upstate New York or in Northern Virginia or, you know, etc. Is the second camera still running? You stopped it? Okay, good, sorry. The only one, the other camera, we have to put a nickel in because it only gives us 20 minutes. <laughs> Uh, if I have your question right, it's simply about being able to create some degree of tourism on our own. Is that what you're saying, or is there is there a national? This kind of thing exists. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful about how you do this because this is alcohol. There are laws involved, and there's also uh, responsibility. If if you were to just independently put together a group of people, uh, you might have a certain degree of liability. If somebody gets hurt, uh, I, I I was thinking more for my wife and I on a self-guided, you know, tour. Let's. Let's say we were going to be in Northern Virginia for sure. a week. Yeah. Well, I, I would contact the local area, the Grape Growers Association or the uh, the Vintners Association in those areas. They exist, and trust me, they will answer you as quickly as they possibly can because they want to talk about their wines. Those are the people I contact often. I get a lot of contacts from PR people as well, but. Um, yeah, they're, they're real good about it because they want to promote their areas. They will often give you, the like the Bourbon Trail in, in Louisville, you can get a, a wine trail. I know we have them in Ohio. I'm sure there's some here in Wisconsin. All right. So yeah, they're out there. You just have to seek them out. And just to tail off of that, all 50 states make wine. All 50 states grow wine. Not everybody's making phenomenal wine, but they're certainly trying. And that's, but that's an interesting idea, you know? It, don't be close-minded. It's it's fun to try it. So I hope that answered your question. Yep. Thank you. Good. Um, are, are we doing okay time-wise, Maria? Or okay. So we'll just go on a little bit longer. I'm hoping those of you who purchased the book get something out of it educational. The one thing that I really got a kick out of is a, a client of mine bought the book and he wanted to give it to his brother for Christmas because he was a sommelier at a major restaurant in Milwaukee. And he gave it to him and I caught him a couple weeks later after the holiday. I said, so what do you think of the book? And he goes, he didn't know half the terms in there. <laughs> Just a, it was kind of a fun commentary which also encourages me to do the second book because I, if anything, want to communicate who these people are why you shouldn't be afraid of wine, why you should never walk into a tasting room and ever be intimidated. There's no reason for it. This is a, an agricultural product. It's not quite like milk, it's a little more fun. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> but the whole idea is, is to open your mind up to things. Steve, anything you'd like to ask her before we wrap it up here? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I would just emphasize approach wine like you approach anything else in life you know if you're curious about it learn more about it don't be intimidated by it um, and uh, what I love about wine is that it's a reflection of your culture your history agriculture science art you know it's um, it signifies that thing in life that we all aspire to which is living our best life and somehow wine is strongly connotated with that that notion so it has great appeal to me um, I think it's a, a beverage that allows you to stop and think about your life as you enjoy the moment whether you're eating it with food or with your loved one with family it's um, you know it's kind of the beverage that's been around since we've been around and is never going to go away so I hopefully that you take that passion with you and you share it with other people because I think in the end it's about if anything else in life discovering enjoying and sharing it with other people that's the point of it and I want to thank Ray for doing this that he's as you heard traveled the world has a lot of different experiences this is a great book to to share with other people uh, who knows what it might spark it might spark one of you guys to decide to become a winemaker someday too so um, and, you know, please be an ambassador of us, but ambassador of Wisconsin wine, be an ambassador of winemakers in general, because um, they have a very unique perspective and uh, they're never boring. Never. <laughs> and uh, for me, Maria and Steve, thanks very much for letting me do this. 
Thank you to all of you for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, it's fun to talk about wine, and it's fun to hear what other people have to say. So thank you. Thank you all. Good job.